of uh, women, particular Africans, um, to ensure that there's growth and um, moving in the right direction as, 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 as women. Um, today's session is one that is quite dear to the society because it, it champions one of our, of our pillars, which is to see women advance. Um, and that is to discuss the, 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 the very uh, glaring disparities in, 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 in pay when it comes to, when it comes to, 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 to earnings. So what I'm gonna do, um, I want to also just welcome everyone. Thank you once again for joining. I see we've got quite a number of people that have joined the session. I do hope, but I know that the session will be one that will be very helpful. Um, it's one that we're gonna go home uh, having learned something and having found solutions to, 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 to sort of um, tackle this problem. So at the start, I'm just gonna share a, a graph that I came across um, not too long ago, sometime last year, pertaining to text information. Okay, um, this, I hope you can see my screen, if I can just get an indication if you're able to see perfect, the graph. Yes. yes. So this is a, graph, uh, which I came across in one of the newspaper, business newspaper application. It's one of the taxpayers that are in South Africa. So at the top, you will see that South Africa has about 5 million plus, a um, little over 5 million taxpayers. And within that, um, there's a split. So if you look at the bottom, we've got female that are represented in red and then male in, in blue. And um, so whatever you see in the graph within red is basically the number of women that are taxpayer. At the top, the split is 53, it's about 54% and 40, 46, which is not quite surprising because it's, I think it's well known that um, men generally have better access to economic opportunities. And then now to get to the rest of the graph, uh, when you start at the bottom, the split uh, between the male and the female taxpayer, it's, it's more or less about 50 50%, up until we get to a point where the threshold 350 to 500K, this is now earnings per, 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 per year. So this could be earnings from any form, employment, business, anything basically. Once we get beyond half a million, uh, we start going to the higher threshold where um, income increases. The split starts um, showing disparity. Um, and then we get to a higher threshold. This is now the more uh, top earners in the country. And obviously with those that are fewer in numbers, um, the split gets even more uh, distorted or um, different in terms of the, the spread between men and, and female. And then the, the, the disparity continues uh, very sharply. So up until we get to the top, let's say from 2 million up until 5 million, um, the top top earners um, in the country, uh, we find that maybe using the example of 5 million, that for every eight uh, top earners, only one out of the eight is female, um, the seven out of eight are male. So is this an indication that perhaps men are more hardworking? They contribute more for them to be um, such high or top earners? I had read a study not too long ago indicating that at uh, any given time, there are slightly more female um, in, in, in higher education facilities, institutions, so one would think that uh, naturally um, women will also be represented uh, in, when it comes to earnings um, because usually in South Africa, if you're more educated or highly educated, your chances of, of being uh, of earning are higher. But that is not so based on uh, information compiled by, 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 by SARS. Uh, this is now from the 2021 information. So with that intro, um, we as um, ACWA thought that um, we can't just leave this to being a discussion and then we, something that we note and we move on. 
something needs to be done about this, especially as people who are already in the workplace. It can't be that we do the work that we do, but uh, when it comes to compensation, uh, we don't get compensated uh, similar to our male counterparts. So we have, uh, as part of the session, um, two, I'm gonna stop sharing, uh, two guests who are uh, experts in this matter. Uh, I've got uh, Professor Anita Bosch, who is currently part of the University of Stellenbosch. She is um, she is a, a, a lecturer, and she's also a she's also a um, so I'm trying to open up her bio. She's also a a a a a, a editor of a news report, Africa Report, which basically focuses on the achievements and the work that is done by women. She's also a very, um, she's a researcher. She's a HR practitioner extraordinaire, I think, uh, based on her profile. Uh, she's done a lot of publications for a lot of academic uh, journals that are out there. Um, she's very apt to be leading this discussion. And I believe it's something that she's quite also passionate about. And uh, with her, uh, I've got uh, Professor, oh, sorry, it's Dr. Stiengam, who's also um, just as unmasked herself. She is a, she's also with the University of uh, Stellenbosch. And um, she's a tax, uh, expert, she's a tax practitioner. Sorry, just one moment. Yes, she is a, she teaches on the MBA as well as a postgraduate diploma in financial planning. She's an extraordinary professor in tax at the University of Asa Africa. Um, she sits on the SICA um, Carbon Tax Subcommittee, which provides input to the National Treasury. Um, so she is uh, quite, um, she's a master in, in taxation and a registered master tax practitioner. So with the information I had projected, um, she also works quite a bit in that type of information where um, tax information is compiled and presented. So um, the two ladies are going to be then taking us through the session uh, where they will be highlighting the cause of the graph that I had projected and also um, what the possible solutions that we can um, take away and, and, and implement so that that gap that I had projected will be um, Will be, we will close eventually so that um, maybe when we have a similar session in three years time, um, the disparity will not be as uh, severe. Possibly we will have uh, closed the gap. So uh, without wasting any further time, um, thank you um, ladies for um, taking us through the session, for agreeing to take us through the session. And I will hand over for you to then run with the program um, you can just detail us what we're going to be um, going through and then what activities we have um, uh, planned for the session. And then at the end, I believe we're going to have a Q&A session and then um, the session will then finish at half past, uh, at seven o'clock, sorry. So over to you, um, Anita. She allowed me to call her Anita and as well as uh, Leanne. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for Ziwe and also Z um, and to the um, ACWA for inviting Leanne, my colleague um, who I work with um, and have actually for this year worked a lot with um, uh, with regards to the current women's report. Um, thank you very much for inviting us over just to chat. I think because the the topic that we're talking about, about um, pay disparities, um, cuts about, uh, um, you know, over so many diversity uh, characteristics, one of which is gender, there's obviously race as well. Um, and so tonight's uh, topic focuses primarily then on, on gender. Um, I'm going to ask Leanne, and she's going to be driving the slide pack for us because we've we've combined our our, our slides. Thank you, Leanne. 
um, just for us to start off um, with the program that we have uh, planned for you. Um, if you can just go to the next slide, please, Leanne, um, so that we so that you kind of know what you're in for. Um, and uh, we're hoping that, you know, a little bit later on, we'll um, also uh, uh, you'd be able to be unmuted and then, um, you know, chat to us and ask questions. So we're going to start off um, with uh, opening and welcome, which is which has happened. And then in the presentation, I'm going to be doing a presentation more broadly speaking on the gender pay gap and sort of what would be reasons for it. Now, it is a hugely complex pro uh, uh, problem, and so therefore I'm giving one lens and there are multiple um, lenses, uh, you know, that 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 one really can can look at. Then Leanne's going to do a presentation on gender and taxes, more specific to what uh, Fezziwe started with, um, uh, with the opening session. And then we decided just to throw in a few mentee polls um, so that you can also become a little bit more active in the discussion. We'll also stop if you want to ask questions at that point in time and then move over to the breakout sessions um, so that uh, we just discuss some of these issues. Uh, actually, one question, what can we do um, in, in, in a little bit more detail? Because as Fiziwe says, uh, chartered accountants are very well placed for for that and to start intervening positively. Uh, then another mentee poll, and then we're going to mop up the discussion points and close. The closure will be done by Fiziwe. So that's what's on the menu um, for this evening. And thank you so much for joining us through load shedding and also the cold weather. So as I said, I'm going to start off with the gender pay gap and really just to position um, this um, within chartered accountants, I at one stage did do a whole um, series of studies on women chartered accountants. And uh, what we do know is that the first woman to apply in 1912 was only allowed in 1917. Um, and uh, it was um, a, a Kruger. And uh, what, what happened with her is, um, if you look at the middle paragraph, um, she applied to the Transvaal Society of Accountants. And um, just look at the wording there. The society sought legal advice to clarify the problematic situation in which they found themselves because she had applied to be admitted. And then the legal advisors agreed that it was acceptable for a woman to serve their articles and maybe she would be the only one and not let the others in. Um, in the same vein, um, uh, you know, if we think about black women specifically in South Africa, non Kololeko, um, Gobodo, you would all most probably know, uh, became the first black woman chartered accountant uh, only in 1987. And um, she then set off to um, start up a number of incredible companies, um, you know, and, and, and which still uh, really do well and is now busy with and Kululeko Leadership Consulting. So um, in honor of these women, um, if we move on to the next slide, please, Leanne, um, the idea of uh, the gender pay gap and why it happens really has to do with a lot with the centrality of the notion of care. And why care about this is what I'm playing around with and then also care work. So the first question and why should we cons be concerned with the, the pay gap at all? Isn't it just a mere fact? It's just the way our society is put together. It's meant to be like that. Um, as some people believe that. Some people even go back to the uh, religious scriptures and, and draw out um, you know, proof there for you and say this is why uh, a woman's position is different to a man's in, in society. And though we acknowledge, I certainly as a feminist stance acknowledge that difference, um, I am of a firm uh, uh, opinion that we can be different but yet still um, equal. So um, why we should care about this is that um, only 20% of black African, 35% of colored and 50% of white and Asian households are headed by married couples. And Leanne will expand on this a little bit later on, but marriage is useful in as far as, if we look at it now in a quite a technical way, um, it's useful in terms of uh, spreading the financial burden. 
um, in a household. Now, obviously, certain households might not adhere to this very same principle, but in general, the financial burden is then split. What this then tells us is that Black African and colored households are particularly um, badly off uh, with regards to this particular statistic if we assume that people spread the load financially. Then when women earn less, they cannot accumulate wealth. And this is something that the course that Leanne also is heading up at uh, Stellenbosch Business School does a lot in terms of financial planning and wealth accumulation. Uh, so women just simply cannot provide for their families um, and look after themselves in retirement especially. Um, and, uh, you know, that's one of the articles that we're writing for this year's Women's Report. And then it's intensified, uh, obviously, when women are private, uh, primary providers, of which we know that in South Africa, most of our households are headed by women. So it is women are the primary providers in the South African um, uh, the, uh, within our uh, demographics. And so our um, census, the I know there's a, there's a new one, and I see I put in 2001 to 2001. <laughs> um, it's to the 2010 census, um, shows that household sizes tend to be larger for colored and black African women than for white and Asian families, which in any event is then this double whammy. So if you're a um, single provider in a household and you um, uh, are not married and you have a larger family, uh, you know, the burdens exceptionally heavy um, and, you know, that would go for for any racial group, but particularly the the um, colored and black African groupings um, really, uh, you know, suffer quite a bit there. And then an interesting statistic um, that was, you know, from another study is um, women spend their days doing unpaid care, in unpaid care work and on a global scale, it's 12.5 billion hours uh, a day. And that's roughly the size of the global tech industry. So care work is a massive uh, blank area in our economics. There's a lovely book called Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? Um, uh, and, you know, that's a very good read for a primer about care work. Leanne, can you please move on to the next slide? Thank you. The knock-on effect then of care um, and and other aspects to the gender pay gap is that women's skills are often undervalued. So and and the issue with this undervaluation, especially in economics, is that it eventually leads to occupational segregation, and so we get masculine and feminine dominated. Um, industries, mining, for instance, quite masculine, uh, uh, education would be quite feminine, doesn't mean that there aren't women and men working in both. But together with that, with what economists have seen with the gender pay gap is that the the um, the sector in which you work has a lot to do with whether you're under or overpaid. And really, the explanation for that is that sectors become, um, uh, you know, specific to a particular gender based then on um, who works there and then how they get paid. And in sectors where women predominate, um, we are paid less. In, in general, the pay is less in, in those. And usually they're more care-based sectors as well. So job evaluation systems, uh, those of you who work a lot with pay and with job evaluation would know that they are built on assumptions of value. What is the value that a person's, uh, not a person's job, that a job specifically holds within uh, a, a larger structure? And so that determination of value um, has historical underpinnings and, and that becomes structural in, in a way. So after a while, we assume that, that you know, um, a, a, a type of a caregiving role, even if it's in a in a mining sector, but you're busy with training in mining, uh, or you, for instance, part of the health staff in mining, or you're a, um, um, a personal assistant in mining. Those are all care and organizing type jobs. Those jobs, the value is then attributed to be less than. Um, the value of, for instance, working underground, uh, perhaps as a miner or doing uh, being a geologist or, or other jobs. 
there's also this notion of or the the reality of career breaks that sometimes some women and we know that it's not all women um, take career breaks um, for those that do have children. There can also be other reasons for taking career breaks and that it's societally better accepted for a woman to take a career break than for a man. Um, but often women would exit to kind of uh, during childbearing years and then try and on ramp or ramp and try and on ramp again. And and that sets us back tremendously. So when you try and on ramp again, your salary is is uh, hugely diminished. There's all kinds of ways for us to try and work around that, which I won't go into the details now of sort of solutions around that. The issue of shorter working hours, um, yes, uh, you know, a lot of people will say, well, there is a gender pay gap because women work less hours. I'm sure everybody in this room would uh, would disagree to that, um, you know, because of your demands of your your job um, or if you've chosen to work half day. But we all know that if you do go down that route, you only get paid for half a day, but you end up doing a full day's work. And so that's never a good option for anybody especially not for women but shorter working hours are um, not the same as the hourly rate and very often with women it might be that we're not working shorter hours but our hourly rate is in fact um, lower and then the last point that I just want to touch on is with union representation that unions are except for one industry which is the clothing and textile industry unions are predominantly filled with men and so gender differentials and structural issues within pay is not really at the top uh, end or uh, you know for unions to delve into and to spend a lot of time on and they rather negotiate on other issues and very often then also uphold the structural inequality because they have a member base that needs to feed their, um, uh, you know, pay every month towards the union. Next slide, please, Leanne. So, uh, Karamesini and uh, Luaki Mogulo um, uh, says that wage setting is a political, cultural, um, an economic process embedded in an institutional and societal context. And this brings in a little bit of the nuance of the complexity of the issue that we're dealing with. It is highly political in, in nature. We think, and for those of you in the room, especially as chartered accountants, would want to say that we have a pay structure, we have job evaluations, it is quite a fair way to judge jobs, but inherent in those structures is politics. Um, I just spoke to value, I just touched on value as one of the elements. It is cultural, meaning um, the gender norms in our cultures would prevail, and certain of those norms would dictate and force particular patterns from occurring and reoccurring again. And then uh, it is definitely an economic process. And we know with economic processes, there's only so much in the pie and the pie has to be split in particular ways. So for instance, and then it's embedded within a societal context. So if uh, with the legislation and so forth. So just coming back to the economic process is if the pie is not large enough, um, if we think about the Second World War, what happened in Europe is the men went off and fought. A lot of them were killed, um, came back only after the war ended. But in the time that they were gone, women entered into formal paid work, um, made ammunition and were paid lower than the men initially um, doing that very same job. And so when uh, men returned, these weapons manufacturers and other forms of, of factory owners had to make decisions and the men were not happy earning these lower rates. And then a lot of women were asked to leave the workplace again and place was shifted up to allow men in at the higher rate. So you can see it's, a, yes, it's an economic process, but it's highly political and, and imbued by, by culture. The next um, a slide, please, Leanne. So my question, one of my questions to you is why are chartered accountants paid so highly? Um, you know, what is it? And looking at that, it, yes, you can say, most of you will say something like, we deal with a lot of complexity, or, you know, we're able to do math. 
um, and we do really well and we can do statistics and we study for quite some time. So, you know, we have scarce skills um, and it's quite a tough course to do. Um, we carry a lot of responsibility. We can um, also go to the history of accountancy. I just mentioned at the very first slide, the first woman was allowed in 1912. I should actually follow up on when the next one came along, but it was much later. So the reality is that women have not been in accountancy for a very long time and men have been in the, um, uh, you know, in that occupation. Uh, but the history of accountancy uh, also has brought about a number of structural issues, which also plays out in terms of racial differentials, which I know Saika is paying a lot of attention to, to correcting. Can you just enter again, please, Leanne? So uh, one thing, though, that I want to challenge you about you know, we can say that all of those points are true, you know, and you and you most likely would agree to those. But also there's the there's a lot of assumptions inherent in determining how much a person gets paid or a job should get paid for, such as a chartered accountant. Um, but it's uh, uh, assumptions about the skills of people, which is really those bullet points that we, I put up up until the history of accountancy. But then there's a lot of assumptions about the nature of people um, that goes into it. So being highly responsible people, being quick to, um, you know, to answer things, being problem solvers and, and, and so forth. But inherent in that definition of the nature of people is also something that's embedded, that it is assumed we assume in our culture that women are born as nurturers and men are not. And so therefore caregiving is natural for women and not for men. And so when it comes to making a judgment about work that requires caregiving, such as being a training manager as a chartered accountant going into training, as you know, being a training manager or managing uh, the, the younger cohort of accountants coming in or any of those more sort of, let's say, caregiving type roles, even as a chartered accountant, um, if you are a woman, there's likely to be some assumptions about your nature that gets made. And therefore, it is assumed because you inherently born with those characteristics, the nurturing, we shouldn't be paying for that extra because, I mean, by all, you know, let's just be fair, you were born with it. But what we forget is that that is socialized into women and a lot of girl children, for instance, I myself have. And, you know, I see this even with my daughter and, and to a certain extent with my son, but my daughter is we would take uh, girls to a kitchen and ask them to wash up, uh, cook food, help out in the house, keep things neat, more so than boys. And so the it is really socialized into you uh, to a great extent. And um, for that, we need to be paid. We've worked a long time to craft the, 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 the caregiving skills but it's seen as something that's inherent, and so therefore it doesn't need to be paid for. Um, next slide, please, Leanne. So practically then, I've spoken about care. Care as, is a big construct within the pay gap, and then the value that we attribute to care, and then a number of other practical things like career breaks, number of hours, and so forth. When we look at the gender pay gap, it's really, um, uh, split into two areas, and and I've taken this from a guide that I did um, a while back in 2020, and it is available for free download on the Stellenbosch Business School's website. Um, and in this, I explain that there's really two levels that we're working on when we're talking about the gender pay gap. So if if you get um, if you listen to a radio program or um, TV or this article about tax people will be talking either to the individual level or the collective level. The individual level would be the, the comparison of particular jobs uh, uh, across, um, uh, you know, earnings across a particular job, uh, which really correlates back to individuals in those jobs then. And then the collective level would be these aggregated sets of data where we look for patterns in pay between women and men at a company or a national level. Now, the collective level is the one that you hear most about. 
um, you know, women earn 73 cents out of every 100 cents that men earn and, and so on and so forth. Um, and there it varies. So Musomi's done very interesting work there. Um, uh, she's at UCT and definitely at the bottom of the pay band, nationally speaking, the minimum wage has brought about a, a near closure of the gender pay gap uh, for the lowest paid. Those of, of us sort of in the middle sector have still, um, uh, you know, a great level of disparity between women and men. And you like with the tax stats right at the top, um, up until uh, 10 years ago, Mosomi found that after democracy, it was found that women's um, in these very, very senior levels, the pay gap closed, started closing. But in the past 10 years, it started widening again. And that is um, that is a widening that nobody really can um, uh, you know, explain. And so that is very concerning, especially if we think about skill for skill match, um, that is no longer usually an argument at that very high level. Uh, Leanne, the next slide, please. One of the ways for us to get around um, this is something that lies within the chartered accountant's domain, and that's the gender pay audit. Um, where pay equality is measured through this audit and, and we take various things into account. This has also been written up in a chapter that's a lovely read, also in the Women's Report of 2015. Italia Boninelli wrote this up. And we really look, uh, we, we look at per individual, per job type, uh, per grouping, across groupings, then men and women. The whole chapter is written up about how to go about and what to look for in those patterns. And obviously, the more it, we get into variable pay, it becomes much more difficult then to, especially when we get into shares and share options, it really becomes quite complex to analyze and, and incorporate those types of issues. Um, but definitely, you know, this is the basic, the basics that we would use and include in, in order to make our comparison. But this is a whole different masterclass and an additional one that we certainly can, you know, consider. Leanne, just the next slide, please. Um, Leanne's going to take over then, um, and you would have seen just on the last slide, um, and, and she'll speak to this as well, there is a website called womensreport.africa, and there you can find a lot of the sort of more detailed work to this. But Leanne, I'm handing over to your um, into uh, and are we going to do a mentee now? Or are we first first? I'm going to keep quiet. You're, you're it's in your hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita, and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you as well to Fiziwe for reaching out to Anita and I. Um, I'm very happy to share some thoughts uh, around the tax issues, Fiziwe basically presented half of my presentation already, so we'll save a bit of time there. Um, but for the sake of um, my bandwidth, because I'm currently in load shedding, I'm going to switch off my camera so that I can still participate um, in this session, but I am here. Um, so let me just share my screen again and go into presentation mode. Anita, can you see my uh, PowerPoint? you perfect, perfect. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so Anita did an excellent uh, job on contextualizing um, the gender pay gap. And so I'm just extending that a bit by looking at how the gender pay gap manifests in the way that our tax system is structured. So um, just to provide a bit more context of where the taxes fit into the bigger scheme of things, a government essentially has three macroeconomic policies, the tools that it uses to influence the economy. So the first one is monetary policy, where changes in the interest rates and changes in the inflation rate um, affect um, our pay patterns, household expenditure, asset prices, and so forth. Then exchange rate policy, as the name suggests, talks about the value of the domestic currency, the South African Rand, for example, relative to other currencies. But our focus this evening is on fiscal policy. Now, being accountants, we know that for every debit, there must be a credit. So fiscal policy consists of income and expenditure. 
So governments uh, incur certain expenditure, for example, on um, infrastructure, on schools, on hospitals, but they have to fund that government spending somehow. And so the income side comes from tax revenue. But if those debits and credits don't balance, the government has to borrow money. So we look at the income side and the expenditure side. The focus of this evening is on the income side, specifically on the tax revenue. So the traditional notions of men as the breadwinner and women as the caretaker, as Anita explained, has also influenced our fiscal policy. So um, fiscal policy is not immune to gender stereotyping. So over the centuries, taxes, tax laws were designed by men for men. And this has changed slightly over time, but there are still some issues with tax laws, not just in South Africa, but globally. So the United Nations, as part of their sustainable development goals, have pinpointed gender equality under SDG 5. And so I think it's worthwhile that we have a look at what this goal envisages. So the United Nations says that in order to undertake reforms to give women equal rights to economic resources, as well as access to ownership and control over land and other forms of property, financial services, inheritance and natural resources. And this is the part that stands out for me in accordance with national laws. So this is my point of departure. Income tax law, VAT law, estate duty, all those tax legislation, those are national laws. So in terms of sustainable development goals, the government can and should use fiscal policies and specifically tax laws to give effect to this notion of gender equality. Unfortunately, though, there are some biases in tax structures. The obvious ones are the explicit biases, and those largely stem from patriarchal traditions, and they manifest as discriminatory tax legislation, regulation, and practices. So these tax law provisions are legally linked to gender. For example, in Jersey, until fairly recently, married women were not allowed to submit their own tax returns without their husband's approval. And closer to home in South Africa during the apartheid years, our tax laws contained several discriminatory practices in terms of both gender and marital status. And I did not know this. I'm a tax lecturer, but I did not know this until I embarked on this research as part of um, Anita's uh, project on this year's women's report. So being a millennial, I had no idea of taxes, you know, when I was a child, when this was in place. But back then, married men had their own tax table and they paid the least taxes. They paid less taxes or at a lower rate than unmarried people. And unmarried people paid lower taxes than married women. So married women and married men had their own tax tables. Now, fortunately, um, when the Constitution came into effect, these discriminatory uh, tax laws uh, and uh, regulations were outlawed. Unfortunately, though, the new tax dispensation, the, the use of a unisex tax table that does not differentiate between men and women, the one that Fiziwe uh, displayed earlier on, resulted in some un intended consequences. So there were good intentions, but it resulted um, in some unequal consequences. And we refer to this as implicit biases. So you could pay the same taxes, equal taxes, but they have unequal outcomes. And this type of prejudice occurs when the tax structures seemingly treat men and women equally but because of the underlying factors that Anita alluded to, the fact that women take career breaks, the fact that there's a wage gap, um, the fact that systems were designed for men and not for women, 
result in unequal outcomes. And I'm going to look at three specific examples this evening, and those are related to that. Personal income tax and single versus dual household. So we Anita referred to the fact that you can spread the financial burden um, if you have more than one uh, earner. This also plays out in taxes. So the key message here is that gender neutral does not necessarily mean gender equal. So neutrality is not necessarily equality. Let's go into a bit more detail. So value-added tax, that comprises the bulk of revenue collections in most low-income countries. In South Africa, it's the second largest contributor to the fiscus. Now, although VAT legislation rarely this, uh, dif differentiates between men and women, and it, it doesn't do that in South Africa, but some countries do have uh, the gender distinction in the law, the burden of consumption taxes falls disproportionately on women. So that is an example of a consumption tax. The more you consume, the more VAT you pay. So why do women carry a heavier VAT burden? Well, I think the reasons for this are twofold. Firstly, as Anita pointed out to us, because women are conditioned to fulfill a caregiving role. So women take care of the household needs, women buy the groceries, women pay the school fees, women buy the clothes. So that's the one thing. They buy more goods on which fat is levied. And secondly, on average, women have lower levels of income. So they have to spend more on household goods out of their lower incomes. And this causes women to disproportionately uh, carry the VAT burden. You may also be familiar with a term that, that's sometimes used in media called the pink taxes. Um, and this has different meaning depending on what type of uh, tax or product you're looking at. So pink taxes generally refer to where the same product is priced differently for men and women. So if you think of a shaving razor, if it's exactly the same make and model, it might cost, I'm thumb sucking this, 20 rand for a man. But if it's colored in pink, it might cost 25 rand. So that's an, an obvious example of a pink tax. The same thing that costs more for women. But more worryingly than that is where women have to buy certain products like feminine hygiene products that causes us to spend more on each, uh, each month as part of our um, savings. So in order to help alleviate the VAT burden, governments have introduced various forms of VAT relief. And in South Africa, I'm sure you know that we have um, a list of zero rated items. So instead of charging the standard rate of 15%, in this case, uh, that is charged at 0%. So examples would include basic foodstuffs like brown bread and maize meal and fresh vegetables. Unfortunately, not the stuff I like, like red wine and chocolate. And also uh, paraffin that's used for lighting and heating are zero rated. So the idea is that the retailer doesn't charge 15% VAT, so theoretically at least these products should be cheaper and the cost savings should be passed on to the consumer. We know though that practically this is not always the case. Now more recently, um, due to increasing pressure from community advocacy organizations, some feminine hygiene products were also included in the zero rated list. And sometimes the media refers to this also as a pink tax. So my question to you, and this is something that we can also discuss uh, later on in the breakout session is, should we expand this list of zero rated items? Should more items be included here to alleviate the burden on women? But bear in mind, if government reduces taxes on one side, it has to increase taxes elsewhere. The fiscus must be in balance. So we have to recognize this, that it's not as easy as just saying, okay, increase 
uh, the list of zero rated items. There will be a knock on effect elsewhere. The second item I want to point out is that of personal income taxes. And Frizzi, did a great job in uh, introducing this, so I can spend a bit less time here. Um, I do want to mention that South Africa has a progressive uh, personal income tax system. We're being chartered accountants, you would know uh, what this means. Um, so essentially, because of our historic high levels of income inequality, the tax system was designed to bring about wealth redistribution. Whether it has actually succeeded in doing that is another matter for another discussion. But the idea is that the more you earn, proportionally, the more tax you pay. So this is in contrast to the company's tax rate, for example, which is a flat rate of 28% soon to be 27%, that is a regressive tax. So it doesn't matter what your uh, income levels are, whether you are wealthy or poor, you are slapped with the same tax rate. So the progressive income tax is a very good idea. And as I mentioned before, the unisex tax table, a good idea, good intentions, but it did have some unintended consequences. So they removed the explicit biases, but there are still some implicit biases. Let's have a look at the some of the uh, tax statistics, which, as you know, is an annual report from National Treasury and from SARS. So the figures that I have here are compiled using the data from the tax statistics. So if we look at a gender analysis, of the recent tax statistics, we see that there is a slow but steady increase in the number of female taxpayers, actually in the proportion uh, of female taxpayers in recent years. So starting at about 44% in 2017 and slightly increasing to 46%, as Fiziwe pointed out earlier. So currently, 46% of personal income taxpayers are women. Remember, this is not for all taxes. Uh, we don't have the gender disaggregated data for that, for example. This is just for personal income tax. Now, despite this, despite women making up almost 50% of the tax base, women contribute only one third to personal income taxes. So almost 50% are women but nowhere close to 50% in taxes. And why is that? Of course, it's symptomatic of the gender pay gap and the other issues that Anita alluded to. So women have lower levels of taxable income, and this translates into paying less taxes. It's not because the tax system disproportionately benefits women, it's because women have less to start with, which the government can tax. Right, so let's go uh, into the figure that Pizzi displayed earlier on. When we conduct a gender distribution in terms of the income tax brackets, we see that it's evident that women are concentrated more here in the lower tax brackets, almost equalizing in the middle. And then as we move up, we can see that the higher tax brackets are dominated by men depicted here in the blue. And in fact, if we look at the top earners, only about 14% are women. And Anita raised an interesting question to me when we discussed this earlier on, and I still don't have an answer for that, and maybe uh, we can get some insight from the group. If women pay less taxes than men, should we even look at the tax legislation to try and equalize or narrow the gender pay gap? Um, does it make sense to target women if women contribute less to personal income taxes? I don't know yet. We'll have to investigate that in a bit more detail. But we definitely see here the gender pay gap um, filtering through the tax system, you earn less, therefore you end up paying less, also being amplified by our progressive income tax system. Now, the 
third and last item I want to touch on is the tax disparity in households. Now, you will know that in terms of South Africa's uh, tax legislation, each individual is a separate taxpayer in own right, regardless of your gender, regardless of your marital status, regardless of your age. If you cross the tax threshold, you have to register as an individual taxpayer. Similarly, each individual is entitled to certain tax breaks. If you think of the interest exemption, or when you do the capital gains tax calculation, you get your annual exclusion. Doesn't matter if you're married in or out of community of property or unmarried or widow, whatever, you get your own exemptions, your own deductions, and your own rebates, like the personal rebates, which is determined by your age. So as a result of this, if you have two income earners in a household, and let's, for the sake of um, illustration, revert to the traditional notion of a household, there's a husband and a wife, both of them are working individuals, they both earn a salary, they both qualify for certain deductions, and they both get the, uh, let's say, the primary rebate. And I'll, I'll do a, a quick calculation just now. So the household combined get the same tax break twice. And this is how the financial burden, the tax burden, is spread out. So that's why from a financial sense, it could be better to be in a dual household so that you can spread the tax burden versus being in a single earner household. Now, this duality, I think, is best explained by way of an example. Don't get bogged down by the detail. This is a ridiculously oversimplified example, but it does illustrate the point. So in the blue column, we have the dual earner household. Let's assume the husband earns 9,000 rand per month. The wife also works. She earns 7,500 rand per month, and they have two minor children. For the sake of comparison, let's assume that in this yellowy-orange column, there's a single mother who works, and she earns the same as the first household combined, so 16,500, and she also has two minor children. So as economists love to say, all else being equal, what will the tax consequences be? So assuming that there aren't any other forms of income or exemptions or deductions, let's just keep it simple. The husband's annual salary will be his taxable income. He falls in the lowest tax bracket, so he pays tax at 18%. Let's assume these individuals are younger than 65, so the husband gets the primary rebate, which for the 2022 20, tax year is this amount and it results in an income tax liability of about 3,700 Rand. We do the same calculation for the wife, and combined, the household owes SARS 4,212 Rand. I'm ignoring employees' taxes now. Now, we do the same calculation for the single earner household. The single mother's taxable income, you will see is the same as for the first household combined, calculate tax, calc uh, subtract the primary rebate, and her total tax liability is almost 20,000 Rand. And you will note the difference between the two, this 15,000 Rand is as a result of the primary rebate, because the dual earner household benefits twice from this rebate whereas the single mother obviously can only claim it once. So this is the working of the um, tax breaks where you get the double benefit for the dual earner household. Of course, in real life, there are more complex calculations, but this is just to illustrate how the tax burden is spread. Now, why is this important? Well, because of the composition of households in South Africa. So Anita pointed out that the majority of households are headed by women. And we see this from the Stats SA estimates as well. 
So I've had a look at the um, latest statistics from Stats SA, where it was uh, stated that about one fifth of households in South Africa are headed by a single person. And when you look at this through a gender lens, it becomes even more concerning. So in terms of child rearing, single mothers by far shoulder the most responsibility. And the stats show us that 42% of children live only with a single mother, compared with only 4% of children living with a single father. So not only are women the breadwinners, but by far the majority, they have to take care of the kids as well. Not just in terms of the financial burden, but also the opportunity cost. So they have less time to spend on their careers or running a business, and they have to take care of the kids. So again, this unisex tax table has unintended consequences where it's actually um, discriminating in a sense against single earner households. So maybe that's also a question um, you know, that, that we should discuss. Should there be a different tax dispensation for single earner households versus dual earner households? In some overseas countries, for example, there are certain tax breaks and tax credits that you can get if you have children or if it's a single earner household versus a dual earner household. So um, that's also something that we can think of. Right, I'm going to conclude my tax discussion here. And Anita, um, let me just pause here for a moment. Anita, would you like to yeah. um, take some Thank questions you. at this stage? Or yes. should, you, should we go into the Minty poll? Um, I'm just looking at it's half past. Um, so I don't know whether there's a um, uh, Fiziwe. Um, are people able to unmute themselves? Or maybe I see most of them are not. Oh, okay. I, I'm just wondering whether uh, or or Z um, whether we should just allow perhaps for a question or two that uh, that somebody might have. Perhaps you can just type in the chat if there's a particular question. I'll just quickly monitor the chat, um, and I don't see a particular question. So Leanne, maybe if we move on to the main tea in All the right. meantime, and I'll be monitoring the chat. And so I'd like to invite everybody here. You know, if you have a question, please type it in and Leanne's going to guide you through Menti. OK, thank you, Anita. So I typed uh, the link in the chat box. You can either use your phone or your laptop, uh, folks. Please go to www.menti.com. It will ask you for a code and you type in this code and there are three questions. So menti.com and that's the code. I will display it um, uh, now as well. So let me go into presentation mode. Anita, can you see my Menti screen display? Yes, mode? yes, and it's correctly displayed. All right, thank you. So please, there are three questions. You can go through those questions uh, at your own pace. You don't have to wait for me. Um, but the first question asks you, does your company perform an annual gender pay gap audit? So does your company perform an annual gender pay gap audit? The second so Leanne, question. Leanne, just is, before you yeah. continue, just to make sure that everybody understands, if you click in the chat on the link that Leanne's provided to you, and then right at the top of the screen that's showing at the moment, there's a code that you insert, and then you'll be able to do the quiz. Thank you, Anita. Okay, so there are three questions. Let's go to the second question. The second question asks you to rank the steps that an organization can take towards closing a potential gender pay gap. So from most important to least important, in your opinion. And of course, uh, this is anonymous, the voting. So you uh, please feel free to cast your true opinion here. I see that there are five votes here already. 
and still in the same pole, so you don't have to leave the pole. The third question, how equipped do you feel in advising an organization on salary equalizing strategies? And you can slide that scale from least equipped to feeling most equipped. So we'll leave this poll open for at least another minute to give everyone an opportunity to vote. And afterwards, we will have our breakout session where we will discuss a question which Anita and I will share in a moment. So there's a question also in the chat. Um, okay. uh, there's uh, Oba King is asking, um, is there some progress surrounding the non-provision of a payslip before accepting a job offer similar to the USA in South Africa? Oba King, I stand to be corrected, not that I'm aware of. I, I'm not sure whether anybody in the room has more recent information. I've not actually been following this in particular. Um, but what uh, you know, the it, it's still very much a practice that most companies use. The more it gets discussed in the media, the more there's awareness around it. As far as my knowledge goes, there's there isn't um, any particular uh, uh, aspects of our legal system, or let me rather say, our acts that uh, prevent a company from doing so. But I'd say that the companies that are much more in tune um, with regards to pay equality would be the ones that do not ask for pay slips any longer. All right, um, I'll leave the poll open so you can still participate, um, but I'm going back into my presentation because it is time for the breakout. So um, you will go into a random breakout room. I think three or four individuals per breakout room and we will have, I think let's make it 10, 15 minutes uh, so that there's enough time for discussion. And what Anita and I would like you to discuss, please, is what are your practical suggestions? So let's be very pragmatic about this. You are all uh, highly qualified intellectual individuals. What are your practical suggestions or tips to help close the gender pay gap and also the gender tax gap? So if you had to submit a list of tips to government, to National Treasury, for example, what would those suggestions be? Or to your company, if you can please discuss this. So I will stop sharing. And if uh, Z or Fiziwe can advise us on the breakout rooms, please. Just um, Z, uh, I think, you know, everybody would need to be unmuted so that so that they can actually, um, you know, participate and and speak is that possible z so anita i'll unmute everybody now and allocate to perfect thank you i think you. we have about 20 so it might be five in each of them okay right okay so there's just one question uh, that you must discuss in the breakout room we like to hear some practical tips or suggestions for closing the gender pay gap and the tax gap please Sorry, Z. Yes, Pedro. Yes, are you allocating the groups? Yes, I am. If you can just give me two minutes, please. Okay, two minutes.
I wonder, Leanne, um, Z, if if the if uh, have some of the rooms been opened at all no, or no. or not. Hi, Anita. Yes. Um, I'm trying to open the rooms. I'm having a little trouble. Okay, don't worry. You know uh, what, Leanne? Let's let's not do the breakout rooms then. If it's it, you know, it's, it's there's always technology is wonderful until it doesn't want to do what you want it to do. Maybe Leanne, if we move over to sharing the results of that mentee poll and then moving um, you know, and just unmuting everybody and giving them an opportunity just to um speak to us or for us to speak to you as well, because this is always important for us, uh, you know, to get other perspectives. So Leanne, as Leanne's putting up um that, can you please share with us the results, uh, Leanne? Sure. Um, Anita, can you see the Menti screen with the results? There, I see it now, yes. All right. Okay, so the first question was, and thank you everyone who voted, there are 17 votes. Um, does your company perform an annual gender pay gap audit? Um, Anita, are these results in line with what you expected? This is more your area of expertise. Yeah, th so this is um, an area that I think as chartered accountants, we can certainly do a lot more um, in terms of pushing, pushing at board level especially, um, as good um, paid practice means that we really should be insisting. And the um, Employment Equity Act changed in 2013. There was a particular clause put in, uh, strengthened quite frankly, uh, towards um, pay equality, equal pay for equal value. And um, uh, you know, it's worrying that um, companies do not perform this uh, pay gap audit. Um, and again, I'm saying in the women's report of 2015, there's a whole chapter on this, how you can go about actually doing that. And so I'll put in the chat the women's report um, address and then just let you know which which one. But definitely companies are not taking it up as seriously as they should. And this is something that a chartered accountant can do quite easily. Um, yeah. Thank you, Anita. I'm just wondering now, do you know, and I don't want to put you on the spot, uh, but do you know that for if for listed companies as part of the ESG disclosures, this would probably fall under governance? Yes, um, it should. And do we see better? <laughs> do we see better disclosures or, or con conducting the gender pay gap audits by listed companies? I'll do tell you, know? you by the end of the year, Leanne, because that oh, okay. uh, two of the <laughs> the MBA students are actually doing a study exactly on that. Okay, um, you I know, was what just types curious, of yeah. disclosure, and it's it's meant to be. You're absolutely right. So according to the King requirements, um, you know, very specifically fair and um uh, and responsible pay. It's with it's in King, um, and so any board, um, you know, could be taken to task that they're not meeting, you know, the the requirements. So definitely, um, it's uh, let's say the burden is larger on listed companies, um, but we're doing that study to find out exactly how they're making it work. I okay, see so Fizzy watch this space. <laughs> yes, watch this space. Fazewe, your your hands up. Yes, um, just on that point, I understand that um, companies need to submit to labor their EE reports. I mean, surely that should be assisting in trying to address some of these uh, uh, inequalities. Yes, I know that is more focused on uh, indicating the number of people, maybe or female, um, on mill management, top management. It doesn't drill down to the actual pay. But surely um, those requirements assisting in, in ensuring that the gap uh, gets narrowed. Yes, so so definitely that's the income differential statement in the Employment Equity Act. Um, that's part of the equity report that's submitted every year for companies with 50 or more employees. Um, but what we uh, know, firstly, is that government holds on very tightly to the statistics on the income differential statement and also the way in which the information is supplied to the uh, Commission for Employment Equity is slightly problematic in terms of analysis for us to really, really understand what's going on there, um, you know, and to aggregate. So, you know, the, the, the way in which it's reported kind of gives you just one way of analyzing it and, and is not really useful. 
But if a company and those that are larger than employ more than 50 people do need to do it, if they go through those motions, um, they're likely to put, pick up a number of patterns. But that's not exactly the same as an audit, as you would know. Um, and so what we're suggesting is at least every three um, uh, to, to, to four years for a company to go through a full scale audit and then to put together a number of plans towards equalizing um, pay um, you know, across the genders. Because there's certain stubborn patterns that often remain um, that one cannot explain. And also the Employment Equity Act contains a clause of all the different areas in which we can differ in terms of pay uh, legally speaking. And that's also as wide as God's grace, quite frankly, you can fit a, a whole Boeing in there and fly it around. Um, but the reality is that that at least gives us some structure with which we can work. Again, I want to refer you to the chapter in the Women's Report 2015 that I think you'll find very, very useful um, in this regard. Thank you, Anita. Uh, the next question, um, we asked you to rank the steps an organization could take towards closing a potential gender pay gap. And Anita, I'll let you talk through the results. Yeah, and so it's lovely to see that people say, you know, the gender pay audit, which again, I think it's just one of the tools that auditors have, um, you know, and, and chartered accountants have. Um, the policy on pay equality, yes, but even if a company doesn't have that, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act and Employment Equity Act um, suffices, um, you know, and stands. So um, very often we want to kind of jump to policy and then we have to negotiate with unions about it and so forth. Um, and, and so one can just have a clause in your policy statement saying that we comply with um, King, for instance, uh, corporate, corporate governance uh, uh, codes and, and, and its, um, uh, you know, its recommendations, or that we say, you know, will comply with all necessary um, uh, pieces of, uh, of legislation. And that in itself really covers you. So one doesn't have to go into a protracted policy um, exercise. I would say the third one, um, and now let me just see uh, my eyes, the disallowing request for pay slips is most likely the very first one that you can make a big, big impact with. And the whole rationale behind that is that women often um, move into jobs at a particular pay level and do not negotiate for a higher um, pay. Now, I know that's generalizing quite widely, um, but there are some other uh, studies in psychology that point to the fact that women don't want to be disagreeable, often our way, uh, again, our cultural norms, especially we know in South Africa, if you think about the Africana culture, if you think about uh, Zulu culture, Kosa, and so on, it's, you know, women have to be demure, uh, you know, you shouldn't stand up against the man. Um, know your place. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, in the Africana culture, there's a, a lovely piece that's written about it that we should, women should be the martyr, you know, you should be the, the mother and the martyr and, and sort of, you know, support the, the man. And, and so, in, and I'm, I know I'm amplifying culture, it doesn't work exactly like that for everybody, but just as a point of illustration. So with that, it means we're likely not to negotiate around salary, entry salary. And so if we enter into a chartered accountant position at a lower salary than the others, and we then move over to a next job and have to submit a pay slip of which they then just add 10% to that pay slip, you keep being behind. You never make up that gap. And mm -hmm. so um, the issue is really to say any good company should have a job evaluation in place and a salary structure. And if you apply, then you ask to be placed at least at the middle point of the band in which you need to be placed at a bare minimum, or you want to understand what the band is and then see where your salary is and then ask for that instead of offering a salary slip. Uh, and that's actually the very first thing that we can make a very big difference um, on a job evaluation criteria. That's a long discussion, but that in itself also is very value laden and it's enforced by the structural inequalities that have come over over many centuries. Thank you, Anita. And then the last question was, um, if you just remove the picture, how equipped do you feel in advising an organization on salary equalizing strategies? 
Yeah. And this is this is quite worrying, eh? This is, and we're chartered account. Well, I'm not a chartered accountant. Let me put my. <laughs> um, so I started off with chartered accountancy and never finished it off. Um, have accounts three though. But the the interesting thing about this is, look at who's in the room. Look at who's in the room, and we don't feel equipped to actually advise on this. So this is clearly an area of great growth that we really start need to start doing a lot of development in the end. Maybe there's another course that we have to put together um, on <laughs> yeah. this. Um, but I, you know, this this is an area that I think chartered accountants can equip themselves quite easily. And there's a number of tools. Again, uh, women's report. I prefer you there again. Okay. Thank you, Anita. I know we only have 10 minutes, but I think it's important that we get to the last question. And for that, I had to go into another poll. I see there are questions in the chat. Uh, let me just run the poll. I'll skip the one question because I want to give everyone uh, the opportunity to voice their opinion. And I'll post the link in the chat and I will display the code as well. So this is a separate poll. If you can click on this new link in the chat and I'll share my screen um, so that you can also see the question there. Anita, can you see my uh, Menti screen displaying? Yes, yes, it's on. Thank you. So uh, if we can ask everyone and you can submit multiple um, uh, answers to this, it is anonymous. Uh, practical suggestions for reducing the gender gap or uh, gender pay gap or tax gap. And while this poll runs, um, Anita, uh, maybe uh, we can look at the questions in the chat and uh, Fazili's hand that was raised. So does everyone know it's the same process as for the previous poll? You go to menti.com and you type in the new code 3307-3929 or just follow the link in the chat. Over to you, Anita. Thank you. And, and looking at Obakeng, um, uh, you know, again, a lovely question. Um, she says, or statement, I think uh, um, arming women with more information about how much they should be earning should be a start. Salaries are generally confidential and aren't permitted in companies broadly. So publicly available information of reliable pay scales could be a start. Um, for CAs, as much as what information is available, there's still differentials within companies. Obakeng, you're absolutely right. I also want to refer you to an article written in the SA Journal of Science by Shimon Barrett and I about pay gap transparency. In that article, we detail, and I'll, I'll see if I can find these links and place them in the chat as well. Uh, we detail how South, African, uh, South Africa's legislation compares to other jurisdictions um, that have pay transparency transparency legislation and in there um, the first thing that we uh, people don't really know is in within the basic conditions of employment act um, there is a, a clause that says that um, uh, basically what it what it boils down to is that employers cannot mandate employees to remain quiet about their own salaries so the notion that um, we sign a contract and say that we'll keep our salaries confidential is actually not completely correct according to the basic conditions of employment act what we are not allowed to do is uh, if we've signed a, a non dis you know a, a, an agreement like that at our company we're not allowed to disclose the salaries of other people if we get to know about their salaries we're not allowed to disclose their salaries but we certainly can disclose our own so for instance one of the things that uh, people can do is you can you can sit in a tea room and say oh my salary is x and then somebody else can say oh and my salary is x um and and so the 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 chain can go, uh, and in that way people can find out what the salaries are. Government have um, obviously um, uh, you know fixed uh, and very transparent pay scales, and so that's another route that some companies are starting to consider um, going. Um, and then in terms of sal salary benchmarking, you can find out what the comparative value of particular um, salaries are or jobs uh, are um, within different industries because the industries do do matter. But I think it's also about arming yourself with with more information and asking questions when you apply for a job to say, um, please inform me about the salary scales, give me more information more broadly, not about anybody else, 
but about this job relative to other jobs in the salary scale. And that's that's general enough and you can ask for that information. I see, I think those those are the comments, um, uh, Leanne, in the chat. Okay, I just want to check if everyone is able to vote. Um, the previous question, I closed the voting on that so that we could get to this one. Um, maybe I can ask Fiziwe, were you able to participate? Um, or are there any questions from the participants? I can't see the screen, so I need to unfuse you where I'll rely on you. Leanne, there are no um, questions. There are practical suggestions that are starting to come up. Let me just uh, okay. show there. I don't know. So the one is more feminine products, zero rated. Uh, the next one, more tax breaks for women-owned businesses. That's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. I think um, that yes. could be very well, um, uh, you know, good, good motive. But Fiziwe, was, uh, you wanted to comment on that? No, I'm just, no, I, I wasn't aware that my mic is actually unmuted. I'm laughing at the full disclosure and company salaries. <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, with, with tra pay transparency is becoming much more of it. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, in, in the pay literature, it's an area that's um, been written about quite, quite a bit. And, um, you know, there are certain um, companies that are moving towards greater levels of uh, disclosure, not full disclosure, um, and, and certainly, you know, trying to, to make it much more transparent. And there's all kinds of ways of thinking about transparency and putting together policies on transparency, um, you know, that, that could also be useful. There's another one, Deanne, that says mm. different tax brackets for men and women higher tax rebates for women than for men, and then legislation to limit hikes on female-specific products, incentives to businesses to discount female products or market at a lower or reduced cost, um, and awareness, RQD, and I'm sorry, I don't know what the, the acronym is. <laughs> Me neither, but I like these suggestions, and it's interesting that, you know, we did away with um, gender-specific tax tables, and now you know we're rethinking doing away with unisex tax tables, but I think it's also important not to fall into the trap of having a sort of a blanket approach to everything. That just because you're a woman, you should pay lower taxes. I think this should also be balanced with a um, what do you call it? A needs analysis or a um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That yeah. that someone that's actually financially in, in the specific yeah bracket. I think what it is you know to to determine to, to determine exactly um who's earning what and who's contributing to to what um you know rather as you've said early and then this blanket type approach because yes we then we regress and we do on to men just as what we were done on to before yeah. uh, which is not useful yeah um, I like the incentives to businesses, especially if it's women-owned businesses. Um, there are uh, certain tax uh, incentives for uh, small business corporations, for micro-businesses, if you think of turnover tax. So theoretically, it shouldn't be that difficult to add an extra qualifying criterion or an extra type of incentive. Um, reduced tax rates, for example, or extra deduction or whatever. Um, so I think there are there are opportunities that, that government can look at, and I'm just talking from a tax point of view. And um, we do have the Davis Tax Commission, for example, who are mandated to investigate specific things. Maybe it's time for government to constitute another tax committee or tax commission specifically to look at gender um, inequalities as their main directive. And Anita, I'm going to um, put your name on as, as <laughs> I, I will volunteer your name and my name for that. Yeah. Let's, and uh, and let's everyone who was a participant in this workshop, I will nominate all of yeah, you. Yeah. And Fizeka has a question there. Fizeka, would you like to unmute? Um, um, thank you. It's actually not a question, it's more of a comment. Um, so, I mean, uh, uh, listening to this presentation, it, it's, it's actually quite depressing. <laughs> you see, that's, that's why I don't 
<laughs> I don't like such presentations because it's it's the situation is quite bad. And for where I'm sitting, I don't think there's a a, a real a really commitment or willingness to to change the picture. Um, South Africa has a, a lot of uh, social economic uh, problems, and you would think tackling uh. You know, women, these pay disparities will be one of the first thing that government or policymakers, decision makers, um, do. But but they don't. Um, I mean, if women women are are, are the key caregivers, <laughs> why don't you just pay them more and eliminate a lot of the problems that we have? But it, it doesn't happen like that. And I think one of the, the the main reason why it doesn't happen like that is because all decision makers are not are not. I wouldn't say they don't have, they don't have interest, but they're not. They, I mean, you. One of the the solutions that was mentioned was the Davis uh, committee. Um, but you'd find that the people who sit in that committee are mostly men, and so maybe they don't have the the, the interest that's the, that's maybe should be there to to fix this problem. Same thing when it comes to 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 boards, boards and companies. So there's the representation it is is a big stumbling block as to why we, this this can't be uh, fixed even policymakers in government okay they i don't even know what the what the what the, the problem is because i think government has one of the more, better uh, representation when it comes to gender but still the the the, the issues that 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 uh, impact women are not are not addressed quickly yet they have the the the, the, the biggest chance of fixing a lot of our problems in this country yeah, Fazeka, thank you for that. And I think it's you know it's important to 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 understand this from all of the lenses, which is the one that you've highlighted just now. I think um, what I want to say is uh, each time when I work with psycho statistics towards the number of women and men, and then the racial um, uh, patterns of of the number of CAs uh, that are being you know that are qualifying. I must say I'm heartened then. I Then I catch my breath and I say, okay, we're going to be okay. Um, because it's people like yourself and the people in the room that really make the difference. And so it is about informing ourselves that life is not business as usual. I remember very, uh, uh, very poignantly one MBA class that I presented about gender inequality. And an answer came from one of the men in the class that um, said, that's just the way business works works, make peace with it. And I am not of the opinion that this is the way the economy and business works. And I know that um, it is us. We are the people that actually, um, you know, that deal with uh, creating these spaces. And so in that sense, I think there's still a lot of hope for us um, to educate ourselves and then to start with with active things, as, as I've said, just a small thing like pushing back on salaries. Um, you will be in management positions or are in management positions at the moment, setting setting the tone for how things should happen. Uh, Mankhadi, uh, you, you you also have your hand up. Yes. I think Mankhadi. Okay, um, okay. Yes, yeah, please I go. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes you, can. you can. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I just wanted to to make a comment um, on on uh, something that I read around. Um, um, you know, um, uh, uh, in a situation where, where, where there is a divorce, where they were saying that uh, normally in, in, in those uh, situations, um, the, 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 the men, um, they, they gain when coming to divorce because they'll find that um, the woman end up with, with, with the children. And because of that and the responsibilities that comes with and taking care of the children, it everything just um, lies on the woman. Even if maybe say the woman gets something for 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 the, for, for the child care of 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 the, of the children. Um, so I just wanted to 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 comment on that and hear what your view is on that one. And also, I think even uh, um, in South Africa, I think the court is actually I don't know whether it's the court or the justice system. Uh, fails women when coming to um, child maintenance, you know. So I think that as well, you know, when coming to children, uh, men and women, um, 
you know, the, 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 that situation, it, it just makes everything worse. And I guess, like you said, that women are the ones that are more likely to, to be shopping for necessities um, for the children. And, and for that reason, then, uh, whatever the, the salary that they have, it, it just, um, um, you know, creates a situation that um, is it's not sufficient in a way. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just to touch on your, your last excellent comment, uh, one of the suggestions that I'm looking into, um, because my presentation is based on an article that I'm contributing to this year's women's report, so it's still a work in progress, is that in some countries you get a tax deduction for childcare costs. So the school fees, the school uniform, uh, those types of private expenses that are disallowed in South Africa, maybe you know we can lobby government that those types of costs should actually be tax deductible, especially if you are a single earner um, household. So I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> and Fiziwe also um, posted in the chat, can care work be compensated? It can, and I it should, but how do we, who should compensate for that? Um, is that, uh, Anita, you you are more experienced yeah. with this than I am. So, so, so this is this is about the value judgments of different mm. types of work. And so care work at the moment in, in Germany is included in GDP and it makes up a third of GDP, of the German sure. GDP. So um, we need to, and we've been putting pressure on Stats SA. I was part of a panel uh, from Parliament that had the st uh, Statistician General um, in the room, uh, um, and, and we've been trying to put pressure on South Africa to also do the same, um, you know, and to, to do the calculation and include it in GDP. Once we have that in GDP, it starts getting another flavor. Now you can start saying, well, what is the contribution to the economy, and therefore how do we translate that back into workplace practice? So I, I know that there is a way for us to, to get around that. For Seaway, um, I'm, I'm handing back to you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. I don't know if there's still a hand. Um, I, see, I don't know if this is an old hand from Fezega. Oh, okay. No, I just wanted to make one more comment again. Um, I think uh, one of the suggestions is actually very personal, but I think one of the things that women can do to 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 better the situation is to maybe have the guides or the, or, or the confidence to try to demand more. Um, um, I, 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 I know it's a personal thing, but it, 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 it helps because I, I have just recently started a job and they obviously they, they did a standard thing of, of, of wanting a, a case slip, which I submitted. But I still demanded an amount that I feel I felt was um, appropriate for me. And the first person to discourage me was actually the HR lady. So, so it it becomes a very inter a personal thing that we as individual women need to work on to to be bold enough to say no. I I I, I deserve this. And mm. yeah. And then secondly, I think there also is room for, definitely there's, there's room for the tax policy to, to intervene in this situation. Like, for, for example, um, you know, the, the, additional tax, the additional tax deductions for, for um, medical care. Um, right. Dis dis disabled children. So you get more deduction if you have a disabled uh, person or child, you get a bigger deduction. So if that can happen, that, that means there is room to, to maybe uh, intervene and have special, you know, uh, deductions that's that are relevant for 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 the for the problem that you face. Yeah, and I agree. Thank you, Fizeka. All right. Um, I think we we we've then come to the end of the session. Um, I see that we've lost a lot of of, of the attendees, but I think um, the the crux of the of the discussion has been conveyed. And at this point, I would also just want to express my gratitude to um, Professor or let me just say Anita, as well as uh, Leanne uh, for really taking the time to sit with us and have this very important discussion. I am actually blown away um, 
by the information that we have received today, um, the notion of, of a care work is something that we've always known, but now if when put in this context, it makes sense why um, we as women don't get, uh, we don't basically earn, it's the value that's attached to the contribution that we that we make, um, that's actually at the heart of it. So, um, and I'm just also wondering if these type of sessions shouldn't happen with men, uh, with the next <laughs> uh, male, I don't know what groups are there for men, but really it's a message that they need to hear um, because they're at the they're in a position where they can actually affect change. But um, nonetheless, um, thank you so much, um, 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 Leanne, and thank you so much, um, Anita. And then I also want to just express my gratitude to everyone that attended. Um, even though we only have a handful of people left, but the, we, I think we had a relatively good um, attendance for this presentation. I see even on my phone, I'm getting feedback on the on the on the, on the quality of the discussion and information that's being presented. So thank you very much. Um, I know, uh, Anita, I think your small gift has come your way. I'm still waiting for, info, for information where I can deliver the other small gift <laughs> elsewhere, just so that we can just express our gratitude for this. I have a feeling that this is not the last time that we're going to be hearing from you, but for now, uh, we've really come to the end of the, of the session. Um, thank you, and everyone must just have a great evening further. Thank you. And just um, if I may, there's information in the chat that I've placed in the chat um, on, on the articles and definitely Leanne's two uh, articles that will be published in August uh, of this year. And thank you very much for the opportunity. And, and then I think maybe at this point, I would want to just, if you are happy to in indicate where else we can find you and the work that you do. I know that maybe we can find you on the website, uh, the Stellenbosch website, but and I know that there's work on the Women's Report, but if there's any other place that you would want uh, us to find you, you're more than welcome to share and even approach us um, for, for that purpose. Thank you very much. I'm I'm so over the hill. I was burnt, born before computers, BC. So <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'll definitely send you fizzy where I'll I'll send you my my details. And and I know Leanne's slightly younger than me, quite a bit. Um, and I'm sure that she's much more active on social media. But definitely, uh, the women's report one of my places. And I'll send you some other de details, fizzy. Right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much and goodbye to everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.